Currently, about 65 to 70 percent of patients at the Rotunda Hospital have a normal vaginal delivery. This is very much in keeping with statistics throughout the developed world, with a caesarean section rate of approximately 30 to 35 percent. Of those patients who have a normal vaginal delivery, the vast majority will have a simple vaginal delivery without the need for a vacuum or a forceps. The majority of patients also do not need an episiotomy. And then the majority of patients can make a decision for, their, for themselves as to what they want to do for pain relief. Epidural anesthetic is very popular, in particular amongst patients on their first time labor. This is because first labors tend to be a little bit longer than subsequent labors. About 60 to 70% of mothers for their first baby will ask for an epidural. About 30 to 35% of mothers at this hospital have a caesarean section for a variety of reasons. The most common being having had a caesarean section in the first labor, or if the labor stalls or fails to progress, or if something happens with the baby's heart rate during the labor process. About 15% of mothers have what we call an operative vaginal delivery, which would typically mean a vacuum-assisted delivery or a forceps-assisted delivery. Of those two procedures, vacuum-assisted delivery are much more common than forceps-assisted deliveries. It's difficult to specify an average duration of labor because of the different types of patients and the different patient situations. But for spontaneous onset of labor, the vast majority of patients on their first labor will deliver at less than 10 to 12 hours. For second and third labors, labors tend to be much quicker than that, averaging less than six hours. For patients who need an induction of labor, however, the time from the start of the induction until the end of the delivery can be quite prolonged, sometimes as much as 24 or 48 hours, depending on how the cervix was at the start of labor. At the Rotunda Hospital, about 30 to 35% of patients have a caesarean section. These caesarean sections are split almost evenly between elective scheduled caesarean sections or emergency caesarean sections. An elective scheduled caesarean section would be one typically where the patient has previously had a caesarean section or perhaps the baby is in a breech position. In that situation, when the patient comes in for a caesarean section, there is no rush, no emergency, and the incidence of any sort of complications is extremely low. Those complications can include bleeding from the uterus, infection, or damage to other organs near the uterus, like the bladder or bowel. But for an elective scheduled caesarean section, these are extremely low risks. For the patients who have an emergency caesarean section, depending on the particular setting in which the emergency is happening, there is no doubt that the risks are slightly higher again. This includes a slightly higher risk of infection, a slightly higher risk of, of bleeding, and a slightly higher risk that the other organs near the uterus, such as the bladder, might get injured. However, it is important to say that even in an emergency caesarean section, these risks are all extremely low. A caesarean section is generally a very safe form of delivery for the baby. The main risks to the baby for a caesarean section relate to a caesarean section done a little bit early. If a caesarean section is done before 39 weeks, there is a slightly higher chance that the baby's lungs and breathing may not be as strong in the first hours after birth. That is the reason why we tend to delay planned scheduled caesarean sections, if at all possible, to the 39 week mark. In some caesarean sections, such as emergency caesarean sections, it is possible that during the surgery, a small nick or cut may be made on the baby's skin, in particular if the uterus is very thin and it's an emergency. But again, these risks are extremely rare. The vast majority of caesarean sections are done through a bikini incision. This is a transverse or crossways incision down low on the abdomen, about an inch above the pubic bone. Typically, the incision is about 10 centimeters long. The incision, when its surgery is finished, is usually closed with either surgical clips that stay in the skin for four or five days, or 
a dissolvable stitch that's put underneath the skin that dissolves away. Sometimes we use another stitch that is left there for a number of days before being removed. It is possible to combine an epidural and entonox or nitrous oxide. The vast majority of patients, however, who get an epidural, the epidural is more than sufficient, is more than adequate to give complete pain relief for the entire duration of the labor. Occasionally, for some patients, the epidural may wear off or may become dislodged in the base of the spine near the end of labor. And in this situation, if a patient needs a little extra pain relief just at the very end, use of entonox or nitrous oxide is absolutely permissible. Pethidine is a very effective form of pain relief that is used in the very early stages of labor. The reason that we reserve it for the early stages of labor is that pethidine does indeed cross the placenta. And if the baby is delivered very shortly after the mother receives pethidine, it's possible that the may baby may be a little bit sleepy. It's what we call respiratory depression. Now it's easily fixed, but it's something that we'd rather not deal with. That's the reason why we don't use pethidine in the later stages of labor. For example, when someone is seven or eight or nine centimeters dilated, just in case the baby comes out in the very near future and might have some respiratory depression. So pethidine is a very effective painkiller at the very start of labor, but really we don't use it beyond that stage.